Friggin' what up, dude? Um, it's Carter Wilson, and I'm the host of this podcast that's mine. It's gonna be called History is Nice. History is What up and welcome back to another ep of History is Dank. I'm your host, Strider Wilson. Fired up to be here. Fired up to be chilling with my dog, Aaron, on the sticks. What up, Aaron? What up? Dude, just freaking dank to be back here. Nice to be in the studio with some nice AC, dude. I love a little A sizzle. I say that because I was sizzling out in the desert, hitting the links. It was nice time, but it was 118 degrees, dude. We went early, too. We got out there, had early tea time, 8 a.m. But you start cooking, you know? You start cooking out there. Um, make, we you, did. make you decide on playing nine real quick. Dude, totally, totally. JT was out there on the links. He was he was tired boy. He got the nickname Tired Boy because he'd been hitting kettlebell workouts. We're like, yeah, dude, of course you're freaking exhausted. You did kettlebell workouts. You like he's like I slept like six hours last night or something like that. We're like yeah, dude, you're just a hero for being out here, but not, not as much of a hero as our as our boy Ferraro, who literally drove out from Orange County to just play golf and then drove back that night for a date night with his freaking GFF, his wife, dude, his GF forever, which was honorable. I mean, the guy likes a nice time. We all get FOMO. I don't know if anyone gets FOMO as much as our boy Ferraro. The guy feels it. I feel it hard. Don't get me wrong. But he feels it. He feels it more. And it was nice being out there. You know, it was, I just, I never thought I would like golf and I like it. Like my GF was kind of, you know, busting my chops, breaking my balls, you know, ribbing me a little bit, just being like, well, now I just date a, a freaking white dad, dude. Like, it's like, am I going to have to get you some Titleist hats now for, you know, am I going to get you a, a, a pair of, you know, one side cargo shorts where it's like only one of the legs on your short on your shorts has a cargo pocket for like extra balls and divot fixers and tees. It's like am I am I gonna have to start getting you some um you know some Under Armour freaking you know some non sweat attire every single time you have a freaking B day? Should you? She's like, should you just start celebrating Father's Day now? You know, am I gonna expect to not see you for four or five hours a day on Sunday? I was like, maybe. I enjoy it. It's just. And I never thought I would. And, you know, I'm, I am distancing myself from relatability with what I'm about to share. But growing up in, in Orange County, I used to get dropped off at this country club. Yep, I'm a moon's length away from relatability at this point called Marbella with my brother. And it was basically like my mom would just be like, you know, my dad would be working. It was summertime. And my mom would be like, you're going to go here. And my dad was hilarious. He's like, you need to learn how to golf. You understand? Business deals happen on the golf course. It's a part of your future education. Success is all that matters. Go out there, develop your swing, meet some people. So talk to these members. They're all prominent, prominent individuals out here. These ladies and gentlemen that are members of this club. Talk to them, engage them, call everyone sir, ma'am. Basically, all I did, though, was I went to the snack bar. I housed wild cherry Pepsis and grilled cheeses. I would work in some tuna every once in a while. I'd work in a tuna salad sandwich, keep it a little bit healthy. But I was downing tropical Skittles and downing wild cherry Pepsis at a rate that was unprecedented. And it was like, you had to like meet a minimum amount of spending requirements. So I was like, you have to spend the money anyway. That's how I justified to myself. My dad's like, I remember one time he's like, who the fuck spent $500 at the snack bar this August? Who did that? I was like, just coming back from the dentist with a bazillion cavities. Like, dude, my bad. It's my bad. That's me, dude. And of course, would never golf. All I would do is just make these little things that we used to call tennis ball grenades, dude, where you'd stick, you take the water cooler in the middle of the tennis court and you take those little like wax cups that they have, like kind of like Dixie cups that you you know would use as mouthwash to the dentist, but a little bigger and then stuff a tennis, you'd fill it up with water, stuff a tennis ball in it, set yourself up and just throw them. Me and my brother would just throw them at other members, throw them at each other, dude, and then run away. So it was great, dude. It was, it was, it was nice. It was, you know, did we feel abandoned and neglected by our parents? Sure. But, you know, are there worse places to be abandoned than a country club where I can just order a tuna salad sandwich from freaking Janet? By the way, Janet, I found out, is still uh, working the snack bar at Marbella, and she is a legend. She impacted a lot of young lives and a lot of people. Janet is a true, true legend. There was this dude, um, 
I'm blanking on his last name, Garrett, whatever. This kid was in high school and sometimes he'd give me a ride home. I'd carpool home. <laughs> he gets a phone call one time on his cell phone and he's like, okay. All I hear him say is, okay, thanks, Janet. Appreciate that. See you, see you in a little bit. I'm like, Janet, that kind of, you know, that name rung a bell because she had an impact on me. The nicest lady ever do hooking it up with freaking dank snacks for my entire, you know, adolescent life. And, uh, Garrett's like, yeah, dude, gave Janet my number. So when they have the chicken soup down there, she just calls me. So I know to go get it. It's so dank. I'm like, you're right. It is so dank, dude. And we went and just got chicken soups. It was nice, dude. It was nice. One time they hired a very attractive, um, young lady named October who went by Toby at the snack bar. And I went there and I was younger. I was probably like 13 at this point. And there was like a bunch of like high schooler kids. Maybe I was even younger, 11 or 12, but like, you know, juniors and seniors in high school just hanging around the snack bar, you know, not wearing their C club polos and khakis. And I'm like, who are these guys? Who are these derelicts getting in the way of me getting my wild cherry Pepsi and tropical and tropical Skittles? What's going on? And, uh, basically they're all there trying to run game. Just a bunch of beta males hovering around October, dude. <sighs> Turned that snack bar. Should have nicknamed it October Sky. Would have been a had I known about that movie at that time, dude. That's where I learned the word prodigious. Aaron, have you ever heard the word prodigious before you watched October Sky when the Shermanator says it? Uh, I never saw that movie, but uh, what? No. Nah. Great watch, dude. Young Gyllenhaal. Young Gyllenhaal. Yeah. Homer. Laura Dern. I love the Shermanator. And Shermanator crushes it, dude. Shermanator is a very charming in this movie. Yeah, dude. You got to go ahead and watch. Do yourself a favor and watch October Sky. It's something that we could cover on uh, History is Dank, too. It's like, a, you know, he's one of the founders of, our, uh, not founders, but early um, NASA rocket scientist, dude. Legit, dude. Huh? Warner Von Braun's in there, the Nazi, dude. There's some, you know, <laughs> tied up, you know, rotten history there with Who? the uh, Americans recruiting Nazi scientists, forgiving them for their war crimes. Who plays him? And like a no-name actor, just some dude who like does a good German accent. Like he he makes like a actually I don't want to spoil the moment if you watch it, but he's he does show up in it at one point. But it's like a a sweet moment in the movie. But it's like a <laughs> it's a small character actor who's probably still oh, that book sweet it. that sweet sweet Nazi. Yeah, dude, exactly. Who <laughs> we needed to beat the Soviets, dude. You know everything in the name of competition. But dude, out there on the links, I was cracking a nice freaking IPA, dude. A nice. Ippa with my boys, dude. When we turn, when we turn the freaking uh, made the turn, dude. Hitting, you know, getting out past hole ten, dude, to the freaking court. You know, the the course marshal, which is hilarious. That golf has like a marshal, which is just basically like an old retired dude, who probably who, who just like gets to have authority out there on the course. There's some nice marshals, but there's some that you can just tell that just want to make sure you're keeping up to etiquette, dude. I think the only requirement for being a marshal is being like, I'm 65 and I hate change. Um, <laughs> think I can go out on your golf course? They're like, of course you can. Get out there. That's it, dude. My resume is just, I hate change. And then, like, I don't know, your handicap below that. Um, but, yeah, dude, we had to make it out. Because, I'm, look, I'm not paying the course price for brews, dude. You know? I'm out there. And that's the number one thing, dude. When you're on the golf course, you're out there, you just got to. My dad's kind of right. You got to talk business, dude. And I'm talking business. My boy Mike Ferraro is out there. He's, got, he's an insurance agent, dude. I'm talking my house business, dude. Do you do e-quake insurance? And I, dude, I'm a valet, dude. Business is down because of COVID. So I'm, I'm searching for what to talk about, dude, over an IPA. And I found myself talking about freaking my Roth IRA. And that fired me up. I'm like, dude, you know, I'm saving, just tucking some stuff away, dude. You know, dude, income's down right now, but still making sure I save. As long as I'm not tapping into that saving, I'm good, you know. And so I was inspired to do this episode, which I think is going to be fire topic, which is IPAs and IRAs. I'm fired up on that. That gets me stoked. And I want to start off. First of all, this can be a highly educational freaking episode, dude. Because if you, I, I was stoked to learn a little bit about IPAs. IPAs, dude, my favorite beer. Stoked to learn the history of IPAs. And my freaking IRA, dude. You know, I, I work for a small mom pop, you know, uh, ballet company. Do they don't do 401ks, dude. You know what I mean? Um... I do like to refer to myself as a CPA on the golf course, which is certified parking assistant. And I like to say that, you know, I'm a CPA with a nice dank Roth IRA. And I'm sipping on an IPA. Okay? Sick. That's what I'm doing out there. So, brief history of the um, IPA. And I was fired up to learn about this. I didn't know why it was invented. 
you know, necessity is the mother of invention, they say, and that's, you know, definitely the case here. Pulled this from an article uh, from a magazine, an online publication. I'm sure maybe they do hard print stuff, but who knows. Um, called All About Beer magazine. I mean, <laughs> kidding me, dude. I'm surprised that wasn't my homepage, dude. Later, Yahoo. Later, Reddit, dude. Although Reddit's legit. You can't talk bad about Reddit, dude. They'll come, they'll take you down, dude. Reddit, dude. I bow down. I respect, dude. I respect. Aaron, do you visit Reddit? No. Neither do I. What's your take on Reddit? Uh, it's just another place for people to be mean to each other. Yeah. Yeah. They try to say that, like, you, there's no negativity or anything like that, but it's just so impossible to police something like that. Yeah. It sucks, man. There's got to be avenues of stoke, dude. Just just stoke-inducing. I mean, you know, Chad's Instagram is a very stoke-inducing, you know, the comment section and stuff. I've been fortunate in my page a little bit. JT's, of course, dude, watching the boys freaking throw around bells. Yeah. Anyway, dude, the story of the India Pale Ale is one of the most romantic in the history of beer. I mean, that line right there from this article just got me fired up. I mean, it just, it's amazing, dude. And it goes back to the British Empire, dude. You know, there's emigrants, sailors, and troops all around the world. And India was one of their biggest import and most important outposts. You know, you get the amazing spices, the spice trade, dude. It makes the world go around, dude, from, for centuries, maybe even a millennium, dude. And um, all these freaking ports demanded brew, dude. I don't care what part of the world you're in, you're going to want brew, dude. Ancient Egypt, dude, they were brewing beer, okay? Now, it would be harsher than the stuff we're having today, but there is evidence of the ancient Egyptians 5,000 years ago, dude, in freaking BC times, just posting up under an obelisk, dude. You know, just straight up saying, what up to Anubis? Just out there in the sun, dude, shirt off, dude, and just sipping on a freaking, it wouldn't be an Ippa, but it would be like a harsher, like, you know, something that's brewed with dates, which dates are dank, dude. And my, my Jeff and I did stop at Hadley's on the way out to Palm Springs and had to pick up a nice date shake, dude. Very, very, very dank, romantic moment. And they're very filling, dude. We just, we just got one, shared it together. You know what I mean, dude? Smooching. Sipping on shakes, dude. I mean, date, you know, it's quite aptly named. Fired up on that. But as far as crew, crafting a brew out of it, I don't know, dude. I don't know. I'm sticking to hops. But, um, freaking doing these long voyages, bro, around the globe for, um, you know, Britain just p- pulling supplies to all of their, you know, colonies. And, you know, of course, col- colonialism is wrong and imperialism and, you know, was very unchill and you know there was tons of oppression um, but if there's any silver lining I mean I think the fact that brews were able to make it around the world and you know keep people stoked as much as they could in the voyage is that's that's tight you know and it'd be you know it'd be sick if they would let the colonies do their own thing um, as we find out you know even in American history we had a boke the British and um, I think it's just important to note in its freaking dank way into history of, of through through brews um, however, you know, regular ales were busters when they're on the voyage going out to India and they had to develop something that could last to get out there, you know, because the, uh, India is closer to the equator. It's got a hot, more humid environment. It wasn't quite, uh, you know, with the technology, this is like, we're talking 1700s for brewing beer. You know, now you'd have an indoor brewery and it would, you know, be AC or whatever you could control it. Um, it wasn't quite a, the suitable environment for brewing ales that they were used to in Britain. So this freaking chiller named George Hodson, dude, a London brewer in the late 1700s, he uses his businessman connections, dude, probably hitting the links, dude, in Scotland or something like that, dude. Probably not, though, probably somewhere more north because he uses his connections to the East India Company. We all know this, the East India Trading Company, um, hugely uh, important company. I, I frequently mentioned the novel Elusias by um, Camus, and uh, a later um, a, a English translation, you know, if you look at translations of that novel, it's the first one is like, tra- is, um, what do they call it? Like, like dedicate it to, uh, to like uh, the explorer, Vasco da Gama, and then there's one that's like dedicated to the king, and then finally there's one that's dedicated to... Um, the East India Trading Company and like that's sort of like colonialism in a nutshell where it's like oh it's it's this epic adventures of ex- exploration and we all love that going to port cities like you know we can all get behind that that's sick 
and then it goes to like oh it's and now it's empire building right and that's not tight there's your colonialism but then it just comes down to the dollar baby um being donated to the east india training company and that's the king the dollar rules all um so just sort of a little snapshot there a little lens of um you know this this era that really starts around you know you know even a little bit slightly before you know 1492 and you know 1500s all through you know even today and now we're going out the freaking space dude if you watch october sky so the final frontier dude freaking get fired up on space sometimes dude you know and honestly one of my favorite ippos is elysian space does so maybe that's how it got its name anyway dude this dog, dude hodgson bro he exported a strong pale ale um now why would he use a pale ale he would use hops dude now hops is important he knew dude being a brewer and the four main ingredients of beers are uh, malt water yeast and hops hops is the flower or cones of a plant called humulus lupulus dude sounds like something that you get you know after you go out to burning man or something shows up in your dongs like what's that that's lupulus dude or maybe that's even your playa name lupulus dude i don't know Anyway, dude, hops help keep the beer fresh longer. They help the beer retain its head of foam. You gotta like the beer with a nice head of foam, dude. Gets on your nose, dude. Never had a milk mustache, dude. I want a freaking ipa stash, dude. And a key component of a beer's aroma and flavor. And of course, add a hoppy aroma, flavor, and bitterness. So it, it really plays into keeping it fresher longer, right? So this guy's like, I'm gonna, he just, he doesn't know that he's making an ipa. He just goes, I'm putting hops in because I know it's going to be able to keep the beer fresher longer for the long voyage to make it from London down to um, the port in India. So turns out these sailors and the and the freaking other merchants on the other end and the receiving end in India sip on this brew and they go, this is dank. They sip it and they go, this beer is danker the longer it ages. This beer has wine quality stuff to it. You know, you hear a wine person talk about wine, you know, they revisit a bottle because they don't want to be gauche. It's like, no, you want, you just want another pour. You want to get your buzz on. Don't talk to, you know, stoners do this too. And I love hearing, I love, I love passion. Don't get me wrong. I love the passion behind wine. I love the passion behind weird, but at the end, behind weed, but at the end of the day, you're getting your tilt on. So if you, at least you come out to me, if you're a wino and you come out to me and you go, Hey, um, you know, my name's Doug. Welcome to the Valley. Welcome to the San Inez Valley. We're going to be tasting some fun stuff today. I got a nice flight lined up for you. I love getting drunk. Um, and here we're going to start off with something a little bit light. It's going to be a Pinot Grigio. It's a little chilled for you because I know there's heat out there. And I love being cool when I'm drunk. I like to get drunk. Um, okay, we're going to move on to a, uh, a Merlot. <laughs> and you know, this is San Inez Valley. Sideways we shot here. You know the funny scene. Oh, Merlot, Merlot. <laughs> Not an effing Merlot. I'll drink anything, even Merlot, because I like feeling drunk. If I had a guy on my tour telling me that, he's honest. Then I can cut it up. Then guess what? I'd get my buzz on. You know, we're probably on some sort of shuttle bus anyway. We're not driving. We're having a nice time. You know, maybe I get an e-scooter at midnight and roll the dice, but I'm not going to be hurting anyone else on an e-scooter at midnight rolling the dice, feeling a little buzz. It's a liberating feeling. Okay. But probably wouldn't have to worry about it. You don't find e-scooters in the San Inez Valley. Anyway, dude, Frickin' Hodgson overreaches, okay? He opens the door to the brewers of Burton-on-Trent. I want to be, honestly, dude, being, if you are able to say you're from Burton-on-Trent, I mean, that sounds like a snowboard, because Burton is a, a prominent snowboard brand name, and Trent is sort of a name of a dude who would be a kook or even a schmoll who does talk solely about investments, not just on the golf course. I like to keep my investment talk to the golf course. Trent sounds like a do dude who's going bald in his 30s. Nothing against bald dude in his 30s, but you got to Mauricio it. You got to commit. Sounds like he's fighting it, you know? So all I'm saying, if you're able to say, oh, dude, where are you from? I'm from Burton on Trent. I'm thinking you're part of a secret society if you're saying that. Aaron, where are you from? Where'd you grow up? San Diego. I mean, that's sick. Ask me where I grew up. Where'd you grow up? Burton on Trent. <laughs> okay. It's a prominent sounding name, and they brewed some prominent freaking Ippas, dude. This is the English Midlands. Turns out the water in there was more suited, better suited than the London water 
for brewing it buzz dude it comes down there's a you ever been a, you ever heard of brooklyn bagel co aaron uh no there's like a few around la there's one in like um what's his name always goes there larry king the dude with the shoulders he always goes there and um I valet Larry King's dome many, or I said dome. <laughs> I was literally thinking that he's because he's got such a big head. That's hilarious, dude. That was a forty-inch slip. He's he's always been nice. I valet him many times. Cadillac, dude. Exactly what I would imagine he drives. But um, he was always at Brooklyn Bagel Co. He, like had his own booth and stuff. But their whole business angle is it's all about the water. Like we use Brooklynized water. And Brooklyn Brewery is a very it's a very good brewery. I had it when I was in New York City. Um, which post up with Chad and JT doing the pod out there going deep pod and um, it's a dank beer so and you know you talk to people who drink tea or coffee the water makes sense you get, we're getting into craft beers here in a little bit the water makes sense and it has from the very very beginning so these Midland beers take over you got brewers like Bass Brewery dude let me freaking cruise down here tell you a little bit about freaking Bass Brewery dude this freaking chiller um, It's I think it's even around today but the, uh, the logo is like that little red triangle anyway. Uh, there's nothing interesting on the note that I put down here. Basically, it was just a legit brewery. Um, but anyway, dude, the pale ale coming from the Trent Valley tasted far better than the London brews, dude, because it's hard water, so the hard water was helpful. Um, produced higher um, and brighter ale, one with a pleasant and refreshing hop character, dude. Um, this freaking Burton Brewmaster, dude, uh, Samuel Alsop, dude, succeeded in brewing one of exceptional quality. It displaced London beers to become the preferred export to the English colonies, dude. And this this came to be called the India Pale Ale. So these English Midland Valley uh, brews are the first uh, pale ales, dude. Right? So this is in the 1700s. Now we're going to go a little bit forward to the 19th century, dude. We're going to cruise up across the Atlantic, dude. We're talking about West Coast Ippas. Not really because we're not out to California yet, but they're heading west, across the Atlantic with some IPAs, dude. So throughout the later half of the 19th century, dude, so big boom here. And this is kind of the story of the IPA. Like, it served a function, and then it took longer to brew, and, you know, it is acquired bitter taste that people love, but brewers in the Americas, you know, people didn't know these quite recipes to add more hops and everything, and the ale just kind of stuck you know this, you got sam adams ale in boston and whatever dude so just regular old ales kind of were ubiquitous and people just knew to order them it was like a you know when i first started drinking brews i was like oh keystone light that's what beer is and then i was like oh no there's other beers there's freaking michelob ultras to where i can just rollerblade and be fit and meet someone at you know i don't know dude i'm pretty sure at that country club i was freaking going to an unofficial summer camp at only served michelob ultras dude you know, just freaking active lifestyle brew. That the, but they got to be honest with their campaign. Their campaign should be like, I like rollerblading and being fit, and listening to Moby, but I like getting drunk, so I drink Michelob. You just got to be, you know, you just got to let people know. I'm gonna feel. I want to feel drunk tonight, dude. It's just the phrase you got to say, dude. Make it feel like a, like a Thursday night all the time. That's still sticking with me from the other night, Aaron. That Eisman stuff, dude. The guy's a legend, dude. Um, so, the freaking fashionable continental pails, uh, pale loggers chipped away at the pails, this is kind of what I was saying, at the pale ale's rightful place in English pubs, dude. The phenomenon was even more pronounced abroad, dude. Britain exported ales to the United States following the original wave of, uh, you know, freaking religious immigrants and everybody else going over there to start a new life. But as in Europe, dude, loggers took over and the ale production dwindled, dude. And then, you know, prohibition essentially wiped things out. So it's gone. Pale ales had their day in the sun, dude. And pale ale is a very photographic beer as well, dude. I often find myself, dude, when I'm trying to fall asleep at night, you know, they've got soothing apps, dude. People are like, you know, calming voices talking to you. I want to just start an app where I just describe a beer just glimmering in the sun as you go to bed. Just it's got a, you know, dank forest around it and we're in upstate Washington and you can hear you know a seahawk flying above and a bald eagle swoops in to figure out what's below it is and it's just a nice foamy head of west coast ipa crackling having been freshly poured and that legit sound of the bottle cap opening legit honestly dude 
I'd probably nut if I heard that when I was trying to fall asleep. I'll go ahead and say it. But the Ippas make a return, dude. They enter their second chapter, dude. As microbreweries cropped up in the 1970s, dude, the long forgotten ales style began to freaking reappear, dude. They used freaking American ingredients, especially hops, were an eye opener to those who tasted those beers for the first time. Very true. We all remember our first sip of a nice hippo, dude. My first sip of a sculpin, dude, down on the freaking patio, dude, looking over freaking um, PB, dude, San Diego, just thinking about going down there and getting a tattoo because that's all that they are that there was in PB was tattoo shops and bars serving ippas. Um, and there's this the first one of the most prominent uh, first freaking. Uh, craft brews, pale IPAs, was the freaking New Albinian Brewing in Sonoma, CA, dude. The first to venture this frontier, dude. Though they lasted only a few years, they helped sow the seeds of the American craft brewing revolution, dude. Then in San Francisco, Anchor Brewery was rescued, bro, by the freaking IPA in the 60s. And, and um, in 1975, it released what is now known as Liberty Ale, dude. Originally calling it our special ale, it was an IPA, dude. An instant classic, dude. It was made with an American ingredients and qualifies as the first modern IPA. Now, you'll notice that this guy distinguishes American ingredients. He's a British dude that wrote this uh, thing. And so he's, his angle, that which I've kind of edited out, is about how like Britain influenced like the IPA stuff. You know, they did. We kind of mentioned that in the beginning. But then over the next decade or so, dude, freaking, and we all know this, IPAs grow in popularity until they become the best-selling craft beer style, dude. Every brewery's got one, dude. There's freaking enthusiasm for it. It's legit, dude. Palates are acclimated to them, dude. You know, you, when you bite into whatever freaking gastro pub you're at, dude, you freaking bite into a brisket. I don't care if it's pulled pork or classic beef, dude. You're going to order yourself a nice Ipa to go with it, dude. And just, dude, the skills, dude, the brewers get, they get bigger and better and bolder, dude. The doses of hops go up, dude. And they freaking create, dude. This is all booming, dude. 50 years later, dude. You know where we're sitting today, dude? There's zippers everywhere, dude. I always have a freaking grapefruit sculpting in my fridge, dude. You better believe that. And I'm sipping them on on the G course, dude. Uh, dude, they're making, st they're breaking rules, dude. That's They're artists at this point, dude, because they know the rules, in order to paint abstractly, you must know the classical rules in order to break them and create art. I can't just go throw paint at a canvas and call it a Jackson Pollock. I got to realize what's going on in the process of doing it, why I'm doing it. I can't create a ready-made Marshall Duchamp, you know, toilet and turn it upside down and call it a fountain. You know, I could go, oh, everyone can do that. But it's the idea and what led him to that idea, what f future or a former and um, past artistic movements led him to that what ales led these freaking dank ipa brewers to brew the imperial ales dude they grew so powerful and so strong there's double ipas dude there's dippas there's trippas dude there's all sorts of dank hoppy ippas floating around dude in the imperial ipa as we know it now dude generally refers to a double ipa dude and um the usage comes from this is a fun fact dude the russian imperial stout a style of strong stout originally brewed in England for the Russian Imperial Court in the late 1700s. So, you know, diving back in time, the craft breweries still tapping into that history, dude. And what's so dank is so many of these recipes, I mean, I would love to try one that was, you know, it's basically the same stuff. You go to those classic breweries that people were drinking thousands of years ago. Not thousands of years, hundreds of years ago in the 1700s, but I mean, I guess you could go get yourself one of those harsher Egyptian brews and try it and drink what the ancient Egyptians were drinking. That'd be tight. So it's just kind of a nice, what's what I love about food, dance, culture, dude. You know, you're, you're tapping into something that people were doing hundreds of years ago and experiencing many of the same things, which is, which is very tight, dude, which is tight. You know, never mind going to a Ruby's, a 50 style diner, dude. I want to go to like a freaking open up a business. That's just a boat that serves IPAs, dude. And you're just cruising around, dude, and just hanging out, dude. It's a pirate lifestyle experience on a boat for a little bit you know you don't murk anybody or stab anyone but maybe you you can probably paintball on there that'd be sick maybe it's two boats lined up next to each other you can have like a paintball battle and sip ipas i'd pay good 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 money i would i would make withdrawals from my roth ira in order to have that experience that's all i'm saying dude that's all i'm saying so i just love the independent nature dude of, of freaking you know brewing brewing these freaking legit ipas dude you know and just these guys are being artistic with it now, and I can't wait to see what comes next for the future, dude. So, I mean, it's beautiful, dude. It's a beautiful, beautiful brew. I'll love it forever, dude, but you can't have too many, dude, because it will be a little harsh on your tum-tum, dude, you know? I wish I was sipping one right now, but Aaron and I are recording in the middle of the day, and i got to drive later. 
and that's the thing those eight those percenters they they get up there dude so now let's talk about dude and i just mentioned i would pull out of my roth ira for a dank experience like that dude um let's talk about the ipa because so many times i find these things coming in conjunction with one another in my personal life and especially on the links is when i'm out there and i'm making the turn and i you know i'm getting outside of the view of the you know veteran you not veteran but you know freaking senior uh course marshal dude who's just looking around keeping his eagle eyes on me just trying to make sure i'm following the rules you know telling me to tuck in my shirt and keep my voice down or something like that and not to text but come on dude, i got text my gf on the g course let her know that i just got a birdie even though i never sent that text i didn't get a birdie but i'm like it's chill dude and you know it's it's in the name of business too i get it they want to sell their own brews but you better believe i'm sneaking brews on with my boys dude you know there's something more than water and in the bottom of that cooler baby so i first of all love talking about perhaps more than talking about it which i absolutely love um i love talking about business and when i talk business i like to be curt i like staccato brief speech and i like to let people know that i make decisions okay when I when I'm purchasing a credenza on Dank on a Craigslist, when I'm getting a Dank credenza, I like to let people know, is that mid-century wood? What type of marble is that? Oh, it looks like a Cremant Mafil Mafil marble to me. It looks like a French origin. Is that a floor marble or is that a surface marble? Let me know, okay? When I talk business, that's how I do it. And I honestly, I get panicked. I get nervous because I'm only a valet, a CPA. I lie. I call myself a CPA. Then when they ask me a question i have to say it's certified parking assistant but i will lie i'll make stuff up you know because i want to belittle whoever i'm playing against if we get matched up by someone because i'm in my business mode okay i want to belittle adult men with my superior investment strategies i like to talk about nanotech okay i talk about fringe markets dude someone hits the ball on the fringe they're not dancing i go ooh, this guy's spending his time in fringe markets must have an aggressive aggressive investment profile Okay? Stuff I don't know about, dude. If anybody asks me a follow-up question, I will fall flat on my face, but that's why I just keep doubling down, dude. I make stuff up, dude. Talk about the G20 summit. Don't know what that is. Don't care about Switzerland. Have no I, I shouldn't say I don't care. I just don't know what's going on there, dude. And never mind Delos, dude. I'm talking about the 420 summit, dude. Okay? I'll make it up. Oh, yeah, you never heard of the 420 summit? Yeah, it's at Del Taco, dude, instead of Delos. And everyone's talking about, of course, future hook, past hookups and buster dads. But we're definitely talking about maybe sound or unsound business ideas while we're boxing our car, freaking crushing burgers, fries, and tacos at the same time. And that's the beauty of Del Taco. And guess what? That's the beauty of a business. Multiple freaking specialities, dude. I will invent words like specialities instead of saying specialties when I'm in the 420 summit with my dogs Chad and JT and I don't even smoke I don't even blaze but I'm gonna get a little contact high in there you know it's just gonna happen have to ask the driver be responsible about it hey ask the driver to step outside who's just the schmoll Kevin be like Kevin dude schmoll we need you to step outside for a little bit we're talking business in here and then when we need some lawyer advice from you even though you're just an injury attorney you can come back in here and let us know if you can draft up papers for it you know of course every business venture is essentially just a new way to do a festival around something tight. Although I do think, remember how like Carol, you know, Aaron, you remember Caroline Calloway? I don't know that name. She like, I don't know, she's like an influencer and then kind of, I'm not exactly sure on the history of what she did, but I know that she like invented like a um, sort of Elizabeth Holmes style like hoax, but like accidental hoax, like bit off more than she could chew like uh wellness weekend for people that just ended up being a disaster it was like we're gonna do the type of yoga i like doing we're gonna like you know talk about ideas and support each other and on paper it's like oh this is great and you know she's does have a lot of followers and people did buy tickets to it but it's just kind of there wasn't the um organizational and you know production value behind it but i'm like dude if i'm at the 420 summit with my dogs i'm like dude me chad jt we do a nice freaking stoke freaking stokeness aka wellness weekend dude we just go out and basically have a batch party with a with a dank squad that'd be tight now you can't force friendship so it'd be tough to do 
but the activities would be there, you know? And, you know, you got to do some axe throwing. You got to play some pong. You got to play some baseball. You got to, you know, maybe host a fantasy draft. If there's guys who are looking for fantasy leagues, maybe that's what this weekend is. You go out there, and by the end of it, you find dudes who you're going to be in a league with. It'd be sick. I'm thinking business because I'm thinking IRAs. Now let's get through this IRA stuff. History of the IRA. In 1971, an Army veteran from Delaware named William Victor Roth, dude, Roth IRA, dude, began his near 30-year tenure in the U.S. Senate, dude. And now he sought to build, you know, his brief stint in the freaking House of Reps, dude. They moved over to the Senate, more prominent, dude, a.k.a. the Millionaire's Club, dude. Um, he wanted to create, you know, a tax benefit, dude, for uh, American citizens, dude. And as part of the Taxpayer Relief Act of 1997, dude, so this is a recent development, dude, this is Roth IRA, a new retirement savings vehicle was implemented in accordance with the senator's vision. And then over 20 years later, the Roth IRA continues to provide investors with unparalleled retirement opportunities over the totality of their lives. Dude, when I'm training a young valet, bro, I'm telling them, dude, I'm telling them right away, dude, banana up, potassium up. You don't want to cramp up in the lot, dude. I'll say it and I'll say it now, like I've said it many times before. Slow on the seat, fasten your feet, you know, have good eye contact, good customer service, be legit. And then, dude, take some of your fat tips, treat your GF to something nice, dude, get yourself an IPA, then tuck some away, dude. Open up a nice, dank Roth IRA because you got to start saving for yourself, dude. Even if you got a 401k, if you got the means, you can put a little bit away there. You know what I mean? It's got to be, it, it fires me up to save. I treat it like, I treat it like, and I love laying down parlays, dude. Freaking Roth IRAs, IPAs, and parlays. Dang it, I should have done a history of parlays. I will save that for a future app. But it's like, dude, you just got to freaking save a little bit. It's going to get you stoked. It's going to get you stoked if you do that a little bit. You'll be like, dude, you know, it's 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 just be able to tell yourself if you're feeling a little bit blue. You get look at you look at your Roth IRA and you go, well, at least I got that going for me. That's nice. Might have just got might have just got freaking cleaned out on the G course right now, dude. You know, playing bingo, bango, bongo with the boys and or, you know, lone wolf or something like that or best ball or something, dude, and freaking lost, you know, third, however many bucks you're playing, maybe just lost 18 bones. But then you freaking go, you got, I still got my Roth IRA, still got that cooking for me. That's nice. It's the freaking slow cooker of meats, dude, for investments, okay? Could put it in there every once in a while. You turn it over, you know, something happened, you know, dump a little bit of dough in there when you can, dude, and you just cook those meats, dude. Cook that Roth IRA, dude. Feel it, dude. Feel it. So, Roth IRAs hold hundreds of billions of dollars in cash and assets today. So it's a current history we're talking here, dude. That figure will assuredly climb as investors continue to adopt the unique advantages provided by Senator Roth's signature brainchild, dude. These accounts, and here's the benefit of them, they don't allow for tax-deductible contributions that are way tra that are tra traditional IRAs do. So there's a Roth and a traditional. We'll get into some distinctions. But the distribu distributions from a Roth IRA may not be taxable if certain conditions are met, dude. The plan holder must be 59 and a half years old. But I'm saving until I'm 69 and a half, dude. What up, fire age, dude? I'm gonna pull out I'm gonna pull out my IRA at 420 PM on 420 April when I'm 69 and a half years old, crush some Del Taco, and then just freaking go treat me and my GF, who would be my GFF at that point, to something dank. So the plan is for a minimum of five years. So just know, dude, you're going to tuck that dough away for at least five years. I mean, hopefully you're tucking it away till you're 69 and a half, dude. 59 and a half, technically. Um, so you could be disqualified from tax exemption. Heads up. So the Roth IRA contributions may be distributed tax-free any time since they bear no tax-deferred benefit in the first place, dude. In another departure from pre-tax plans, the Roth IRA hold me and dude. Reading about freaking finance stuff, dude, it's just dry. You hear me just have to bail out right there on that? It's unreal, dude. I mean, it's sad. I mean, I think it's telling why so many of us are in debt, dude. You know, it's just a bummer to think about, honestly. And it's like having to stage a financial like intervention for yourself when you get real about it. But you just got to get real about it. First, eliminate your debt. Then start saving when you can. And you got to wait. I don't know, dude. It's just tough to find a way to make it accessible, Aaron. I mean, maybe... All right, I'm going to try to hammer through this next paragraph here. And maybe every once in a while I'll just have to talk about a dong or something like that. And just, or part of my French, like, you know, nah. And you maybe just keep it the dongs. I mean, who doesn't like hearing about dongs? And just, um, I don't know, maybe that'll have, make this more digestible, dude. The Taxpayer Re Relief Act of 1997 also expanded the parameters of the IRA eligibility eligib dong. Precious meal metals. 
such as like a, you know, Wolverine probably has a metal dong. I wonder if there's like, um, he's got adamantium in, in his dong when he pops wood, which it wouldn't even be wood. He'd be popping metal. Per section 304, gold, silver, platinum, and palladium items that meet their respective purity minimums. What are they even talking about right now, dude? I got to skip ahead. They're just saying they invest a lot of Roth IRA stuff into precious metals and hard resources that, you know, basically it's blue chip stuff that's going to help your money grow just like a dong when you see something nice. Nothing makes my dong grow. They want to see a nice credence, and I imagine the nice moments my GF and I are going to have around it. And not just the physical, intimate ones, but the emotional ones as well. You know, laughing like at a show that we watch together. Or, you know, bonding over, you know, a nice book. I tend to read over my GF's shoulder sometimes. He's like, get away from me. I'm like, well, what are you reading? You know, they, sometimes they turn into nice conversations. Sometimes they end, I don't know. Maybe I got to switch it up from the dong talk getting through this Roth IRA stuff, dude. Um... Let me do a few distinctions here, and then maybe, Aaron, maybe we just got to play Never Have I Ever while talking about finance stuff. Maybe that's the trick, dude. Just write a write a finance book and just play Never Have I Ever while while reading about it. Like, um, all right, dude. Roth IRA contributions come from after-tax dollars. Max contribution for 2019 was six was six k, seven k if you're over 50. It goes up a little bit every single year. Those with earned income below a certain level contribute um, traditional contributions for a traditional IRA um, dollars. Aaron, you got it. I think I need a. I think I need a never ever ever right now. You know, and I like put a finger down or something like that. Like you could ask me, never have I ever, um, never have I ever, when my GS been out of town with her friends, thought that a ghost was gonna pop out of our closet. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. I have. Yeah, hundred percent. I have. Yeah. There's just no question. I have, dude. Yeah, could be Ignacio. A hundred. Yes. Never have I ever imagined Ignacio beating me up. There's no question he would beat me up, dude. He's buff. That's the. That was the real. I mean, the truth of the matter is, I had to move apartments. Now there were some other contributing factors, such as the construction and Jerry, freaking just taking down six like a freaking way I take down an Ippa on the links. But basically, I was like, my neighbor's just going to beat me up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let me see if I can hammer through a few more of these. Um, I mean, dude, basically, all you need to know, a few distinctions. You're going to want to know Basically, it comes down to this. Dude. If you have a 401k, you can get a loan out on it, which is tight, up to 50% or 50000 whatever. If you got an IRA, you can't take a loan out on it, but it's the best way for if you're running around in the pink-collar, blue-collar guy. If you're a young guy, time is your most valuable asset. Get out there and invest. The sooner you can, it's the most valuable asset you have. I wish I was doing it when I was 1-8. When I was 18, I wish I was laying it down. wish I was laying it laying it investing as much as I could, you know, when um, I first started valeting. But, you know, I came into it later, and that's fine. That's fine, you know. Aaron, do you just want to hit me with a quick never have I ever just because it's going to be so fun? It's so hard to think of them. It really is. I feel uh, like you have to be flirting a little bit while you're doing it. you got to be like, it's got to be like a flirtatious energy, you know, not like reading finance energy. So maybe it's not the best flat mashup. Yeah. But maybe if you say financial stuff in a flirtatious manner like if i were to tell you the dis the difference in forced distributions between 401ks in a traditional roth ira as well as a as a traditional ira and a, as well as a roth ira in a flirty way it might sound more fun like if i was like <laughs> like with 401ks like you must start withdrawing funds at age 72 like <laughs> unless you know employee is still employed with employers setting up the 401k and not at like I don't know, 5% owner or whatever. And the penalty is 50% or minimum distribution. Like that's for a 401k. Like, what are you doing? No. And like, I guess the weird part is that like for a traditional Roth IRA, like you must start withdrawing funds 
at age 72 like yeah 59 and a half should, should be your benchmark or for me 69 and a half <laughs> what 69 um but the penalty is 50 percent of minimum distribution and um, for a Roth IRA it's it's just none so I don't know you hang up first was that more interesting way to hear yeah about yeah I think so yeah like you know I guess you have to make stuff you know if, when in doubt you know they say sex sells I think horniness is what they mean sells. Nobody really wants to talk about, you know, a lot of us with sex, myself included, having a small dong is, is tough, you know? But I've developed other traits, such as the dart, and the tea dart, as I like to call it. Um, and, you know, it's maybe tap into parts of myself and better myself in other ways. However, horniness is something that drives economy. And people need to get horny about saving. You know, savings and investments. Investment's just a form of savings. But how do you get horny about that? Well, It's tough. It's kind of antithetical. 100%. Because horniness is all about, ooh, I need it right now. But guess what? Just like a good musical beat or just like that anticipation of going out with your crew when you're having drinks and, you know, the whole week, you know, the weekend's ahead of you. Anything's possible that night. It's going to be fun. You just got to be horny for the future and I think that's what it is future is horniness you know and that's tight and I think investors need to top, tap into that dude you know like Chuck you know Schwab Merrill Lynch I want to Fidelity all these companies dude I just want to start an investment company and just call it horny dude hornity you know Schwab your knob that's it Schwab, your knob, should be my investment strategy company. And it's just strictly Roth IRAs and IRAs. And it's all for valets. Dude, there it is, dude. Your business got a rhyme. Here it is. We invest instead of in precious metals, like, you know, not adamantium, like, you know, freaking Wolverine, but like whatever they're saying, gold, silvers, copper, you know, raw resources that are going to, you know, be safe and, and constantly in need. By society, water, rock, investing in straight up quarries, dude, where you find bodies. But dude, I'm going to invest, I'm going to open up an investment company. It's going to be called Schwab Your Knob. Okay. And this is what I'm going to talk about on the golf course. Cause you got to have vision, dude. You know, when I'm trying to belittle somebody, dude, who is, I know pulls in more jing than I do per year, even though that's why golf is a thing. Cause you can still beat that guy in the course of the game. And that's what it comes down to. It's about, you know, taking out that guy next to you. Yeah, sure, the, the, great, the real enemy is myself and the natural environment. False. I'm like Seabiscuit on the course. I got, if I could wear a suit and golf in it, I would, dude. So when I want to take out that guy, I'm going to go, oh, yeah, okay, interesting. Do you pull this much or no? You, oh, you're upgrading from a Range Rover to a Jaguar? Nice, nice. Yeah, I love British vehicles. Get it in British racing green. It's a great color, great color. Yeah, yeah, so what am I going to do? Yeah, I'm opening a new company. Yeah, sorry about that. Sorry about that. I'm opening a company, and it's called Schwab Your Knob Investments. Oh, what do we invest in? IPAs. We only invest in craft beer. And everyone that invests with me, I got to get my anchor investor. And guess what? It's just multiple anchor investors. It's all frickin' valets who get fat tips. They're liquid. They're cash. They are cash heavy. They come in here. They invest in a Roth IRA in their future. The money's not going anywhere, so you can count on it being in there. I'm going to make sure that everyone has to withdraw by 69 and a half, unless you hit some sort of emergency. And all of my investors, come invest with Schwab. Come invest with Schwab your knob industries where we get horny for the future. Never mind security. We're talking horny. When you pull out, that's a sexual term. But when you pull out of your investment, you buy yourself some jet skis and you cruise around with your boys. I don't know. I'd sign up for something like that. Now, I know that the history of the IRA, I mean, started in 97. It was this chill senator. There's a few distinct distinctions between a 401k. Basically, if you get a company that can do price matching, that's nice. If you're a young guy or gal listening, time is, the, is your most valuable asset. Start investing now, um, at least saving, I should say. And it's a very, very uh, non-aggressive way to do it. It's legit. Um, but before I move on to a few questions, 
I just want to talk about real quick the best IPAs in the world today. One through ten. Okay, and this is according to ratebeer.com, which should also be my homepage. And I, if I do go into the tech industry with my new investment company called Schwabernob Investments, um, I would invest in this website. Number one IPA in the world, Ale Smith IPA. Never had it, want to try it. Number two, Bell's Too Hard at Ale, dude. Number three, here we go. Ballast Point Sculpin, dude. What is up? My favorite brew. I do love the Grapefruit Sculpin, but the Ballast Point Sculpin is a traditional, straightforward IPA. So dank. It's number three. First is the worst. Second is the best. Third puts hair in your chest. I'll take what puts hair on my chest. Number four, excuse me. I'm like getting little hot burps just thinking about it, dude. I'm having like bottle, like literally having like visceral reactions to talking about IPAs. Number four, Russian River Blind Pig IPA. This is the same brewing brewery that does Pliny the Elder, Pliny the Younger, and I've had Blind Pig IPA. It is dank. It is dank. Have that with a nice burger. Really treat yourself to something nice. Surly. It's uh, Amager Todd, the Axeman, Surly version. I want to try it. Anything called Axeman, I'm in. La Cumbre Elevated IPA. It rhymes. I'm in. Fathead's Headhunter IPA. Sounds like a Predator beer. I will drink that and I will walk Predator. That's number seven. La Castor Yakima IPA. I'm, I'm intrigued. I want more. I'm is this of, of Japanese origin. La Castor sounds like a... Le Castor sounds like a French name. I mean, this sounds like some sort of combination of dankness that I'd like to get myself into. It's like French for podcaster. Yes. <laughs> That's great. Uh, Satyr Brews, Mency IPA, Surly Furious, number 10. I'm in. I'm in. All right, let's do some freaking cues, dude. Aaron, do you do you have an, IP, uh, an I, IRA? Do you... Uh, have a nice little something going or a 401k set up? Uh, I believe I do through my wife. Oh, that. Hey, right. hey, the wife. That's the classic 401k. You know what I mean? Hey, daddy-o. I like to talk like that sometimes when I'm, uh, you know, making old school style guy wife jokes on the golf course. Hey, boys. Nice to be out here on the course uh, away from the wives. You know, hey, four hours out of the week. That's all I get. Whoa. You know, hey, it's like, um. Your entire personality and humor is defined around hatred for the person you're supposed to love. <laughs> but you say it in a fun voice. This is my shield. <laughs> this is my shield. I talk like this. Whoa. Guns are blazing. I'm a sad guy. This is the same guy. This is the guy who was pouring you beers in the Santa, or uh, wine in the San Inez Valley. You ended up you know, making friends with him. Never go to a second location with those type of guys. You know what I mean? You're there. You, you have fun for a little bit. You, you know, we're, oh, we're friends. We're buddies. Yeah, 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 let's exchange numbers, but never actually use them. That's the way you handle those type of dudes. That's just how it's done. I, look, I've done, I'm a valet. I'm in the service industry. I can say this with authenticity without trying to, without hurting anyone. Actually, I will hurt anyone, but I hurt myself as well saying it. That's what you got to do. But did you get... You know, you, you go to a second location with the wine pouring guy. He's going to come out in the golf course, and then it's going to get sad. He's going to tell you, well, the reason I like to get drunk is because my wife. I have no free will. I just feel like I don't have free will. I feel like I could have been, you know, maybe he goes to artist round. I could have been an artist. Or, man, I've always wanted to go to Europe, but, you know, my wife's job's here, and she loves it. And uh, I pour raw wine. I like to pour. I mean, it's good wine. The Valley produces a great grape. That I like to get drunk off of. Hey man, do you just want to go? Do you just want to go, man? Anywhere? You know, that's where that that's where that goes. Okay? Trust me when I tell you that. Trust me when I tell you start investing early with freaking Schwab your knob investments. And trust me when I tell you you cruise to a second location with the dude who's working at the freaking wine industry or the freaking you know wine tasting place. Stuff's liable to get sad. You can count on that. All right, dude. Quick questions. Hey, dude. It's actually not quick. It's kind of a longer one. Um, just discovered the pod and have been absolutely crushing it over the weekend. My stoke has gone way up listening to the Valet app. Oh, no, fire. Thank you. When you talked about the Valet Olympics. 
yeah, dude, I'm fired up on that. It's a goal of mine to get in that. I'm real fired up because I've been working as a bike messenger for the last bit, and we've got a similar thing going with the Messenger World Championships. Whoa. Which were just in Jakarta, the Euro Champs in Brussels, and the North Americans in Philly. Dude, that's awesome. I think it's pretty freaking rad that these kinds of co uh, comps exist um, as these kind of weird fringe sports, but no one outside of those specific professions really knows about them. The only other profession I can think of that has like a world championships is maybe firefighters, I think. Yeah, that is true. I think I've seen some videos of that. My question for you is, if a regular blue collar profession had a televised league of competition on the same scale of like the NBA or something, what profession do you think you would be the most would be the most ill to see a bunch of dudes battling out to see who's the best at that job. That's a fire. Dude, that's a great like discovery channel show right there. <laughs> like just blue collar professions doing battle or like competing in their professions for a championship or some sort of, you know, bragging rights trophy. I love that. I think I've seen like firemen, like ladder climbs, hose carries. Basically it's probably like that's what CrossFit grew out of like that in Navy SEAL competitions. Lumber, lumberjacks also lumberjack yeah like the great outdoorsman sports i used to watch that on spike tv i love that stuff dude i love that i could compete in the great indoorsman of just drilling myself playing xbox too much and you know st loading the dishwasher at the during the qt and making sure that you know calling spectrum and making sure wi-fi works quickly and you know creating a dank meal with my gf and decorating our apartment i could really win at the great indoor games but to answer this question what blue collar job would I want to see? I mean, postmen could be pretty sick, dude. I wear postman style socks. If you're watching on the YouTube video, yeah, let me get a better angle. Always have, always will. It's not a good look, but I always will wear the postman style socks that go up to the past the ankle. But um, I think it'd be sick, dude. They drive a truck. They, their trucks, their driver seats on the other side. They could like. You know, do like that, like weird winter Olympic sport where like the skiers like walk and then shoot at something, you know, on skis, but just do it in their car and then like throw freaking envelopes out and try to make them into mailboxes. They could do a reverse cone race. They could run against, run from dogs um, fast. They could give each other paper cuts in like a, you know, night style combat mode. They could do all sorts of sick stuff, dude fashion show who's got the most jacked calves who can wear shorts in the coldest environment still i don't care what city you're in there's a postman always in shorts in that city i do not care if you are in canada and the yukon even though that's not a united states postman i don't care if you're in whatever the coldest part of the u.s is like the tundra and like wyoming or something e there's a postman wearing shorts there delivering a you know a message to a freaking will to freaking buffalo or something that's out there a freaking bull moose what would you want to see, Aaron? I mean, I do really want to see a moose. I would love to see a moose. I'd love to see a moose. No, but I mean compete. Like, uh, what blue-collar industry would you like to compete? Oh, wow. I completely missed that question. No, that was my bad. Because I was <laughs> talking moose. And, dude, this is, a, this is the second time we've said on this pod that we do want to see moose. I would love to see a, a real moose. And dude, they're like they're like six foot at the shoulder, aren't they? Yeah, or seven. Yeah, it's crazy. And I think Teddy Roosevelt named his political party the Bull Moose Party because it's like such a badass animal. Yeah. Uh, what kind of a sport mm -hmm. competition from a profession? Yeah, like you know, what's that Joseph Gordon-Levitt movie where he's like the fixie bike rider in New York? Like this dude that rode in. His name's um, oh, he's Brett from Canada. Legit. Brett from Canada from Canada competes in like Messenger World Championships. I want to do the valet. Yeah, what was that movie called? It was uh, Premium Rush. Premium Rush. Yeah, Michael Shannon was the the villain. Our dude, our dog, He's friend, friend of the pod. Love, yeah, big friend of the pod, Michael Shannon. No <laughs> question, dude. Michael Shannon can just come on here and have a staring contest with me. That should be like a just a show that Quibi should have done before it failed, or like. Funny or Die should have done of like just Michael Shannon has a staring contest with someone and that's the whole show. Well, I was trying to think of this this show I used to watch, uh, and I found it just now on IMDb. It was hosted by the veteran old guy from the first season of Survivor. It was a reality uh, show called Combat Missions. 
What? It was on USA, and it was basically SWAT versus Navy SEALs. Amazing. I mean, or Special Forces guys. Amazing. Uh, and so that that was a pretty cool thing. Uh, I mean, like one of the dudes who was on the show is is one of the guys who got killed in Iraq. Like that was dragged through the streets, like famously, and his body was. Whoa. He was one of the Navy SEALs. He was Whoa. a real fucking weirdo on the show. Really? But yeah. Uh, yeah, you got to be a different breed to be a frog man. I mean, yeah. it's just, it's gnarly. They're like yeah. super intelligent. I've watched like something on Netflix. It's like they're, the way they're like, they're like Harvard level intelligence with like, you know, medieval knight strength, <laughs> Navy yeah. SEALs. They're badasses, dude. Yeah, Scott Helvinson was that guy's name. Look him up. He he got killed in 2004. Um, but, but yeah. But that's a great that was That was a cool show. I mean, they had like all this... Um, all these crazy like not it was kind of like laser tag because obviously how are you going to have dudes shoot each other Mm -hmm. like that's a real (laughs) real problem yeah but uh, they had this really cool setup for it I don't know where you'd find it uh, online but it was cool that'd be badass I would love to watch that that would be awesome also just found out that Rudy the host of it uh, and former Survivor contestant died November of last year age 91 Whoa. 91. That's a good run. What a beast, dude. Just getting it down on Survivor. But he he was a retired Navy SEAL. Well, dude. I wish I was a retired Navy SEAL. I'm just so soft. <laughs> There's just no way, dude. The water's cold. I mean, I jump in, I, I literally, ah! And he would, would be like, what was that, dude? Was that a baby SEAL? And then I would just get sniped. All right. Just do a, do a couple more here, and then we'll call it, dude. Says he's a veteran of World War II and Vietnam. I don't think that's possible. That would be tough. I think there are some that have done that. You would have had to have been like 18 in World War II. So say you get like stationed at the very end of World War II, 1945. He was born in 28. So he would have had to have joined at 17, like the last year of the war. Could be done. Yeah, I mean, World War One that was very common, but that could be done. You could forge a birth certificate, get in. Yeah, I know people who joined at uh, Vietnam in seven, at seventeen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he's in. He's in World War Two. Yeah, it could be done. I think there's like a few. I remember when I went to like visit Normandy, not Normandy, Arlington. I would see like soldiers of like oh World War. And there was like some like some that were one, two, in Korea. That's one that was popular that wow. I saw. That was, yeah, that's gnarly. Man, experiencing World War One and Two, which were like very vastly like different strategic wars, yeah. and both the scale of death in both is just insane, would be what an insane life. Um, but we're trying to give people a run for their money in 2020, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> um, Strider, my dog, it has been a stellar ride through your dome and my. My dude, and similar to many of our other dogs, I feel closer to all the dogs around the world than I have ever felt. So thank you for the space of dankness and self-reflection. Love that, dude. I mean, that's one of the nicest things I've heard about this pod. Um, since I, too, have been parking in a six, uh, partaking, excuse me, in a sick six-year relationship with an absolute legend babe, much love to my beans. Love that. Must be a nickname they have for each other. I have a relationship history combo question for you. History, what history? What is the history of you and your GF? Where did you guys meet? And what have some of the peaks and valleys looked like within the relationship? Much love to you, dog. I look forward to chilling at the comedy club in Chicago, protected by Joe's hog, after people in the coronavirus stopped being so unchill, of course. Your dog, Jake. Legend, Jake. Um, dude, my GF and I met in San Diego, Aaron's birthplace city, legitness down there. Uh, she was doing... My GF went to SDSU. I went to UCSD. and she was Tex. Yeah. Oh, you went to SDSU? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I think I knew that. Yeah. Yeah, dude, I, SDSU is the best San Diego school, dude. I mean, USD is nice. It's like, you know, if I'm de- being a dad, I'm going to call USD. It's a cruise ship without water. You know, they got sand in the library. You know, it's like it's like a beautiful freaking uh, campus and um, really pretty. But state, dude, San Diego State's the best school, dude. The parties were amazing, dude. One time I went to, a, but you know, if you weren't from there, the dude energy was always aggressive, especially with the frat culture. But I didn't, you yep. know, delve into that too much. But one time I went to a party and a guy was like, "Do you know where you're at?" And like, no one had asked me that question before because, <laughs> like you heard earlier on this podcast, I grew up pretty sheltered, dude. 
I just complained about having to spend summers at a country club. So the relatability factor for me right now is out the window. But um, I was like, wait, what? And I like literally answered his question. I was like, yeah, it's, um, yeah, the party's like right up there. He's like, no, no, no. I know where the party's at. I'm wondering, do you know where you're at? And like, I was dressed in like a Buzz Lightyear costume. I was like, yeah. Like trying to do like the ironic kid costume thing, you know? So I had a rough experience, you know? He ended up being an okay dude, though. I remember he was running game on this girl. This was very rude of me in hindsight to do this. I shouldn't have done it, but um, somebody farted in the kitchen that we were in. <laughs> <laughs> and this guy was running game on the girl, and I nefar- this was sick of me. This was sick of me to do this. Um, I was like, he, he called it out. He's like, who farted, dude? And I was like, oh, I think she farted. And it was the girl <laughs> that uh, he was running game on. And she didn't fart, so I, she was collateral damage in the scenario, and I apologize to whoever that was now. Um, she's like, no, I didn't. And and I was like, I think, I, and I didn't really respond to her, and then he's like, she didn't fart, dude. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, I was like, no, no, she did, I, I heard it, I heard it. And luckily she like she didn't say anything, because if she would have doubled down and did then like I would have definitely been the dick, but he doubled down so hard in defending her honor of not farting that it was like it usurped every other energy, even my like uh, um, very uh, evil, um, you know, coaxing <laughs> evil energy that I was push- putting forth to get to this guy and ruin his game running session, which I did ruin it. You know, the romance was gone after that, but just him being like, no, nah, dude, she doesn't fart, bro. <laughs> you fart in kitchens, dude. She would never do that, Who this girl who I just met. And honestly, I don't know her name. I've been calling her like, her costume that she's dressed up as right now, which is Cher from Clueless. So she never farts, dude. You fart. As if, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I just want you to be like, yeah, right, dude. And then snap your, your helmet closed, your butt legs, your helmet closed, <laughs> and then walk out. That'd be amazing, dude. <laughs> to infinity and beyond. Um, but yeah, dude, freaking been... Dating my GF a long time, dude, and uh, she's the best, dude. You know, obviously there's highs and lows through that, dude. You know, I mean, um, mainly highs, though. My GF's very freaking dank, dude. She's a total stone-cold chiller, dude. Um, She did move back down to San Diego for a little bit while we were dating, which was tough, but it was brief, and then came back up to L.A., so. But, um, yeah, dude, all good stuff. I know that's a little broad, but um, I appreciate my dog asking, and... uh, yeah, dude. I think. I don't know, Aaron. What do you What do you got? Uh, I don't know, Billy. If he asked for any advice, he was just looking for a little personal history and just. I think really what matters is that we have stuff in common and we, we, res- respect and uh, support each other's goals and visions and everything. And um, to quote Bruce Springsteen, "I want to guard your dreams and visions. Um, you can't start a fire." Although I think that's not that song. I think that's, <laughs> I think the guard your dreams and visions is from um, Born to Run. And then I was just quoting um, Dancer in the Dark. Dancer in the Dark, yep. Two fire songs. Both songs probably start with him going, uh, D, D, uh, uh. <laughs> um, Yeah, dude. All right, let's do one more. If you were uh, going to use any piece of historical military equipment slash weapon slash map, whatever, as decor for your apartment, what would it be? Blake, Ken. Uh, That's a great question. That's a great question. Maps I do use as decor quite frequently. I have got a dank one of L.A. So even though it would be cool to have like a cool like parchment map or like a Portland map of like cool port cities from, you know, exploratory times or something like that. Um, or even like a map of the stars, which was the very first maps that humans developed on the caves a long, long time ago. It was maps of the stars. That's, you know, how people would navigate by ship, but even by land. Um, so fun fact, the first maps weren't of Earth, they were of stars. Dude. And perhaps the first map was man putting his handprint and saying, I've been here. Uh, I mean, wall. isn't it so true? It's It's hard to see where you are. You know? 100%. That's why you got to just be dancing in the dark. (laughs) (laughs) Dude, Ben Seller has the best bit. I think they did one like, 
they did a Time Life album thing on SNL of just Bruce Springsteen, but just the um, like no music, and it's just like um, him. He's like talking about summer jobs. One of the tracks is like summer jobs, counting, fixing up old cars, <laughs> like uh, bars I've been to, uh, fights I almost got in. You know, exes is just gold. It just all stuff he talks about. Um, man, I would probably use like, I mean, a samurai sword. It's been done, although it's very cool. I mean, you want to have something like a, a trip you've been on or something like that. I don't know. I remember one time I was in Hawaii, and I like that there was like a little volcano man, um, that I, we went to like go visit a volcano, and I remember I was like. I told my brother and we grew up Catholic and I, you know, my mom bought us a little souvenir volcano, man. And I was like, dude, Greg, let's go home and pray to these things. <laughs> <laughs> it was hilarious. I was like, dude, we can pray to them. And then my dad's like, no, you don't pray to them. Like you, there's only God who you pray to. And I was like, oh, whoa. I didn't realize that you can only, and then, but it was kind of a weird, interesting lesson where I was like, can I be multi-religional dude? You know, I don't know. I guess you can't. I guess you can. I, maybe you can. I don't know. It's uh, it's tough to bring stuff home. Like it's tough to bring anything authentic home. Like I, you know, mm -hmm. I brought like a tiki god home from my dad from Hawaii, and it was just like, yeah. As soon as I flipped that thing over, it was like, oh, made in China. A hundred percent. That's what I got. I got the same sort of tiki god <laughs> thing, and a volcano rock, which is why to this day I've had no luck. No, I'm kidding. Um, I don't know, dude. Yeah, you like, supposed to take something. You, you aren't should, supposed to bring stuff back. You are Hawaii. not supposed to. No, no, no. I mean, I'd have, maybe have to get a GF approved to go, but if I had got my uh, druthers, as they say, and I can put anything I want anywhere, I might take like a William Wallace broadsword. That'd be sick. Yep. Put it above my desk area. Yep. I have, I have a broadsword on my wall. You have one? Yeah. Oh, I am jealous of that. Yeah, yeah. It's from Lord of the Rings. Oh. Sword of the King. Aragons? Yeah, 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 of course. Who goes by Strider, by the way? Thank you very much. Yeah. When he's a ranger. In the book, that's all they call him. That's so sick, dude. Honestly, maybe I could have been named after that because the books came out a long time ago. Yep. That's so sick. There you have it. You go, broadsword. I think so. I think so. You put it on a wall. Or Clear. literally, you put it in a stone, and then you don't invite anyone in your apartment if they can't get it out of it because they've got no <laughs> honor. <laughs> but then you have a secret, uh, like the thing you step on. That's a, that keeps it in place or lets it go. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> you got to have something to dupe them a little bit, dude. Yeah. Fire, dude. Aaron Legend, dude. Thank you. Guys, another uh, fire ip of, ep of IPAs and freaking IRAs, dude. Roth IRAs. Legit, dude. Check the episodes everywhere you get podcasts, and they're on YouTube as well. Just as a reminder, if you want to watch, dude, um, which is always kind of sick to do, dude. And, uh, you know, you can just do the audio, too, if you don't, you know, aren't on any of the podcasting apps. But it's all over the place, dude. We're spreading it like wildfire, baby. And uh, spreading stoke with my dogs. So stay stoked, and we'll catch you next time. All right, dude, late.